to to dive into this a little bit. And Anna, uh, you know, this this goes right into some place that uh, you know, Peter here has to sort of describe. Yosemite National Park in the United States also does not have good internet um to it. And so uh, you know, here in the United States we have the same and similar issues with internet coverage or uh, ability to um, access globe data in real time. But what I wanted to really highlight here is uh, if you're able to do that, a couple of things that we, that we want to always do with our data, okay? So um, you've come back, say you've come back and you've now uploaded your data to the GLOBE database. And one of the things that I uh, presented earlier to uh, the students in Japan um, from our presentation earlier is this, we're asking uh, throughout GLOBE Observer, what are the surface conditions? Are there leaves on the trees there? And so here I'm showing you a graph of that question, uh, just through the land cover question and the land cover protocol. And what we clearly see based on who contributed, uh, we can see leaf off conditions develop early on in November, December, and January, and then persist for a couple months. And then uh, we see the leaf on time period here sometime in April, again, across those people who contributed data. And this signal right here makes a lot of sense for the Northern Hemisphere. And so, Anna, to me, this is an, an interesting uh, uh, piece that you were highlighting is making sure that we do have a representation, we move this up, um, of the Southern Hemisphere in particular. And, um, and and, but, you know, what, what I see is a possibility of being able to uh, easily record this leaf on, leaf off phenology question. Um, and then we have the photos that are uh, submitted that correspond to that uh, leaf state or the phenology piece that we're seeing. Um, so I just, I was really impressed with how, um, only, you know, 38,000 observations around the globe uh, were, whether they intended to or not, were helping us to answer this question of phenology with trees. Are there leaves on the trees or not? And I think one of the things that becomes really interesting is later we have uh, maybe different contributions that are making uh, it kind of usually be both leaves on the trees in February and leaves not on the trees, kind of an equal amount are, are, are getting provided. Um, so I, I, to me, this, this is, it, it's an interesting data story that we can now start to tell um, using the data that's come in from Globe Observer. And again, you know, one of our questions, Anna, is um, we want to make sure that this observation is in the right place so that we can then check this phenology pattern or greenness pattern to what we can measure with satellite data, uh, which is going to be more consistent over time. So um, to me, this is really, really pretty exciting. Um, so let me ask right here, Peter, do you have any questions? Or Anna, do you have any questions about uh, how Globe Observer uh, 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 participation in our campaign has actually given us one data point here that, that has a very interesting trend that seems to make some sense to me? How about you guys? Let me think here trends I 
I see that there's like a, as we see through 2019, 22, and eight, all through the years, there seems like a, a, a very high period and then like a low period. Exactly, um, Peter. Yep. Is that due to the pandemic or is, what is that due to? Well, right. So, so, you know, if we usually, what's really helpful is knowing um, at each one of these months, 2019, 2020, 2021 is the beginning of the year. So that's our January time period. And so in the Northern hemisphere, uh, one thing that we just, we, we know uh, from our own experiences and, uh, and our conversations is that usually you have uh, less leaves on the trees, or it's less green out there. Now, in South America, where Anna is joining us from, we have the opposite happening, right? Uh, where we actually have uh, summer during the January, March, April um, time frame, and uh, and so we would expect uh, a different pattern to be occurring if we were making our observations there. And so one is just like you said, Peter, just noticing that it's not all green the entire year or the entire time period. That's a really good thing to to highlight because then comes the next question. Why? Right. Uh, and um, and is this something that we did with our measurements or is this something that um, is actually a pattern that occurs? And if it is a pattern, well, again, why? What what other information might we need to explain what is happening here in January? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, Peter, I have a question. If there were to be a perhaps like Senori a forest fire, is, oh, go, in, go, go ahead, Anna. January in Latin, in most part of Latin America is a holidays in in schools. January and February is the, the long holidays. Yes. So Anna, you hit on something really, really important is that uh, this data trend could be related to our student participation um, um, and civic events and engagement. And so we really do need to, uh, you know, take it another step further and think about who might have submitted this and does that relate to the pattern that we're seeing i love that you highlighted that because you're right anna that's a really important part where um why we actually go to another data set um and the satellite data is a good piece where sometimes it can fill in information when we're not focused on making that measurement for some of the reasons you mentioned peter you were going to say yeah, I wasn't uh, noticing, you know, um, the trends there. I was going to ask if there were to be perhaps like a forest fire spike, you know, a forest fire, would you see a spike in the amount of um, uh, greenery and you know, like things are starting to bloom at a different time? Would you see like a peak um, in something yes. like that? Yes. Like and the forest responding to that? And that's a, that's exactly one of those trends that when we talk about climate change or um, successional processes is we do see this onset of green up or green down, um, you know, where it goes from being really green to maybe being really brown here, like this October to November time period. And in the same thing with the with the spring shift, um, March to April, um, you know, that that is one of those things that we're able to track with e even just our ground photos is, oh, we see here in the south photo, in fact, we see some green grass underneath. Here, I'll blow up that photo here so we can actually take a little look at it. And so this is something that that is really part of why land cover is so fascinating is because you can actually have green up in an area that is occurring differently depending on the vegetation. You know, you can have the, the grass on the ground green up maybe even as early as February, while the trees above it um, might always have needles. And it in, in that case, it, there might always be a greenness to that because you have evergreen trees. 
but they're up higher, right? That, that photosynthesis is happening higher in the canopy. And that's one of those things that this picture helps us to see is where is that green happening? Is it on the ground or is it up in the sky a little bit, right? And then we also have, if these um, green, if these areas here did, lost their leaves, we would see a drop in greenness again because we wouldn't have leaves in, in the up there. And we would be able to see further um, because there would be less leaf area uh, um, that would actually be obstructing our view. So ultimately, when we go back to our statistic, our, our, our question here that we're asking everybody, are there leaves on trees when you make your observation? The, this area between when we go from yes to no, um, dominantly, is that leaf on leaf off question, uh, phenology question that uh, with more observations and over more time, uh, we'll be able to hopefully see some of those changes happening. Um, but Peter, that's exactly to me, one of these exciting pieces is, um, is this pattern that we're seeing here um, just temporary or is it going to keep going on and on? And I guess this is ArcGIS data. Well, it's globe data that you put into ArcGIS. Exactly. Um, yeah. And do do our teachers uh, around the world do they have access to this if they have um, a free ArcGIS, you know, um, a login? They do, and this is actually a copy of the globe data that is being put into this ArcGIS online environment um, to help make things like this dashboard. Um, and uh, and so that that is exactly something that you can you can find um, because uh, our globe observer team is making copies of uh, and putting that data um, to make it more accessible to teachers. And um, and and like I am only showing the land cover photos here, um, but you can do the same thing with the tree heights, the clouds, and even the mosquito habitat data is accessible there. So all you need to do is go searching for Globe Observer, ArcGIS, and you will find uh, this data layer that's available for uh, use and visualization through uh, that particular platform. It's not the only one, but it's a good one because one of the things that uh, Anna, you really helped to, to highlight, I wanted to, to see, well, okay, we saw this green up, green down pattern that we were just talking about. Well, that to me makes a lot of sense because of where I have lived my life, um, which is north of the equator um, and you know close to 45 degrees north. And one of the things that that we see when we just map uh, the latitude of people's contributions is we really do see this North America European uh, bias of our data contributions. And this makes a lot of sense to me um, with that green up when we saw it and the green down when we did. If this was flipped, and we were seeing more data coming in from the Southern hemisphere. In fact, we would expect our graph of leaves on trees to be doing either the opposite, or if uh, like Anna was highlighting, you know, in some areas we might have more consistency where leaves are always on the trees. So making sure that we're getting uh, contributions from the entire globe, is really important. Otherwise, we our, our data could mislead us or only represent one part of the globe community. And uh, and so I what I really love is some of these hard edges that you can see, um, which are the uh, US and the Canada border right here at 50 degrees north. And then we start to get some more contributions during, uh, this is all the pandemic. And so you can see that we do actually get um, on a couple of days some really good global examples of contributions um, around this May time period. You can see that it's uh, we're getting contributions from um, far south 
all the way north of the equator um, as well. And uh, and so you can you can really see who's contributing to this particular data set that is telling us when leaves are 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 coming in and off of the trees that are out there. This was really fascinating because Anna, this really demonstrates how we 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 are not getting a, a true representation of uh, the phenology of the the trees in South America or in Africa or Australia or uh, you know our southern uh, South Equator uh, globe countries. Peter, this was another graph. What do you think about this one? Hmm. So like an attitude equator. Um there's a lot going on there. I just see squealy lines here. I do see yeah. peaks above the latitude and equator there. Mm -hmm. Um the time series it's rather uh, it's kind of hard for me to see. I just see I mean I, I know it's a time series. Um I can see the months there. Yep. Um what is this entire globe uh data for yes this is everything inside of our map um okay. and so you know people made contributions and made observations at different locations uh across time and uh and in in fact um uh, you know one of the things is just by paying attention to that one latitude value uh that we have we can we can see in fact when globe observer launched uh, or the land cover tool was launched inside of there. We had a hot, we had a high number of contributions, you know, uh, a large number here at the very beginning from North America, with a few contributions down south of the equator, you know, uh, uh, below this red line, and that is because. Uh, you know, most of Anna and uh, the the contributions we have some, from South America, the latitude value ranges from minus forty five to zero to the equator right here. While in the northern hemisphere, we just have more land, and so in fact, we can have more contributions from the equator all the way north to the North Pole, and um, at at plus 90 degrees north, right? So this this squiggly line that goes back and forth, similar to um, uh, 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 many, many time series graphs like this. What I'm really interested in is making sure that we have black above the equator and black below, like we do here on this particular date uh, in, last year in 2023 when we were doing our where's the water challenge, right? And so there we can actually see that we have data below the equator and data above the equator. And so, you know, this goes back to Anna's question of, if I don't have a map, uh, how do I know that the latitude and longitude that I'm recording are correct? And one of the ways is knowing what to expect when you are working in a certain part of the world, right? Um, if if uh, Anna gets a number that is uh, 45 degrees, uh, that's incorrect. And she knows that it should be a minus 45 or a negative number south of the equator, right? Um, and so you, you, this is, I think, a really important skill that scientists develop um, uh, is uh, a little sense for what numbers to expect based on where they're working in the world. Uh, so that when they're presented with data like this, they can start to make some sense out of um, what might be presented to them and whether it's correct or whether it, it might mislead them in some way. And so, you know, Peter, I think one of the things that's really helpful is we've been looking at the whole entire globe here. Well, I wanna zoom in to our say really southern countries uh globe country here uh we have uh chile and argentina 
and Brazil as our globe countries. So this will take a little bit of, of, of time uh, to filter our data set, but you can already start to see that things are kind of moving and popping around. And what this is doing is it is showing us only the contributions of what we see in the map here. And so we can actually look across time and we can see the different latitudes going north and south that have been contributed from this part of the globe uh, uh, community. So Peter, now let me ask, what do you see? Obviously, a lot of the, the since the, the location is lower than the equator, I can see a lot of the um, the recordings, the measurements are below the equator, meaning you know we're we're down south there. Um, I love how you can basically go to any country, any point, and see their data and how it populates. Yeah, there is so I, much. This, I'm there looking is at this a lot for the first time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and that's and and to me, this is this is something that I want to stress to all of our students out there and our teachers is um, trying to make sense out of 55 data um, attributes that are getting recorded when you use Globe Observer is a lot. And we've now added in the ability to take feature photos, in fact. And so uh, not only do you have six photos and all of that information to work with, but you have now four more directional photos uh, that uh, might be available. So that's our enhancement to this is to make is to surface that information. Um, because if we go back to our, if we look at our, our latitude here, our contributions, um, uh, one of the things that's really interesting is um, I, you can't see the value for one. I don't have that, that enabled, but we can see the dates of those contributions. And, uh, and we can see right around here, um, you know, towards the end of August 2022, um, there was sort of a significant um, amount of data that kind of came in uh, um, both north and south in that particular time frame. So that might be something interesting that we want to uh, think about and look at. Um, but what I want to do is go back to our leaves on trees question, right? And when here we see a different pattern emerge, it, you know, and when we go to a different part of the globe, which gets a different amount of sunlight, um, which has a different rotation and different community um, uh, contributing, uh, uh, you know, their observations. So let's bring Anna into this conversation. And Anna, let me ask, what do you, um, we've been talking about this graph and can you describe um, any patterns or what you might see when, um, when you're looking at this graph of that question, are there leaves on trees, yes or no, on a particular date? Yes, I have a measurement tree in the July and July. In the maybe real in a lot in in January in 2021. Mm -hmm. Maybe I... maybe citizen science the measurement contribution. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, and I think you know um my my numbers seem to be a little bit off here. Uh, uh, hundred or, or I take that back. Um, so what I wanted to 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 demo discuss here is we have five hundred and six unique locations that have an observation that uh, that is represented in our question: Are there leaves on the trees? And in fact, um, uh, most of those actually have two uh, land cover observations in them because we have a total contribution of 1159 of those and that's what we see on the map here and what i find really interesting is at least here uh, we have one that is the furthest south in south america um and that would be an interesting one to look at 
Um, but what that also opens up is this whole Patagonia and, and the southern uh, area is not represented in our globe data in, in our land cover data set. I, I live in the north of Patagonia. Exactly. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that's the, the Patagonia that's, is very big area. It is. It is. And so so this to me is is one thing that if any, I'll make the, the call out to, to say if there's anybody out there who is, uh, you know, going to this part of, of, of the world and would like to help us um, and help Anna in particular um, and her students, um, you know, it would be wonderful to use Globe Observer and to do these contributions to science because right now we don't have a representation of the land cover. Um, in that area. But w I will say, you know, one of the things that we did, this high this data set does highlight is, uh, you know, during the pandemic time period, we were able to get more contributions. And what we see is the leaves on the tree question is the reverse that we had in North America, where most of our contributions were coming from. And what we see is that here in June and July, and then August, and we see the same thing in uh, 2020, um, in July, in August, and then September, that is th when the leaves are not on the trees if they are deciduous. And, uh, and so, you know, in contrast, what we were looking at earlier is in the Northern Hemisphere, this was the time when we had the biggest greenness, green going on in those areas. So Peter, you know, this to me is is a really fascinating piece where yes, there might be a global trend. But if we zoom in on particular locations and regions, we might actually see the exact opposite trend inside of there. So people's individual stories and uh and experiences might be lost in the giant pool of observations. But I love being able to go in and see some of these things that are the exact opposite of what I experience on a daily basis. I love looking at the data as well and, and, and basically using this as a pep talk to say, look, this is our data for our country. Um, you know, where, where we should be, We maybe we should step it up. Uh, let's go out there and, and do an intensive observation period and, and get more data. Um, so that's kind of neat to see that that you can see what each country is doing and how they're progressing and making these observations. Exactly. And Peter, I want to highlight over here one of the places of improvement or that we um, need to develop uh, uh, some time and 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 do is actually label these uh the 506 locations uh yeah, the mgrs locations um you know right now they don't have any tags associated with them which is what you see over here in this pie chart um most of them uh we have to add some information somehow to find out that there's buildings or that there's a certain greenness um in that area and what that greenness means. So there's uh, a lot more areas of research even amongst this data set because what I like about this map, I, I selected it per, for a particular reason. And that is because our view of this part of the world is really dark right now. Um, we don't have a lot of information, right? Um, we have a couple samples here and there um, and uh, and 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 Anna, keep up the good work. You guys are doing a lot of of great contributions here. And um, you know, because if we actually zoom in, I'm going to zoom in on just one of these locations to highlight a little bit of how close we really have to get um, to understand and what this sample really is. And like you were saying, uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, this, this, uh, does this represent that larger area? Um, it looks like it's, it, it, it is in a city area, right? And I was surprised because I thought there was only one point here, but I zoom in and wow, 
um, we have a really high density of points that were taken. This here in, is the project. I comment the project in the, the starting of this webinar. This measurement is the, the, the uh, corresponding the project with the exchange uh, in University, National University of Comahue and uh, University um, of Texas at Tyler. Ah, wonderful. And, and one of the things that that will allow you to do is look at this latitude difference, right? Anna, um, you know, be, between uh, an area that's north of the equator versus an area that's south of the equator. And uh, and what I like here is um, you know, what was contributed is we only have, yes, that there were leaves on the trees in April and May of the, of the year that this was uh, contributed. Um, and if we went to uh, Texas in the year 2024, uh, would they also have similar conditions? And if they didn't, uh, why, right? What are those environmental variables? And, and one of the things that, that like I was mentioning, I, I like about this particular view, um, you know, is that uh, with a little bit more uh, time, one of the things that, that we want to do is look at where these photos or where the data, globe data was taken in relation to another data set, right? So this goes back to what we were just talking about is, uh, you know, just because a measurement was made doesn't mean that it was, uh, you know, really at that right, at that location that ends up in the globe database. And Anna, you, you really highlighted how tree cover um, and uh, instruments, and there can be all kinds of factors that lead into this. So one of the one of the science activities is actually going through and not just looking at these attributes, but zooming in on these locations and looking at uh, in relation to this high resolution satellite, do we see the same features? Uh, is this in the right place? Because if it's not in the right place, then uh, we might need to move it or we might need to adjust it before we do anything else. Um, because again, I wanna go back and stress how important it is to, uh, you know, if you're claiming that you're in this part of the world, well, let's, uh, 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 let's double check that with some of the satellite data that, that gives us that perspective and that ability to, uh, you know, look at these photos, look at the state that um, has been submitted and be able to connect these things together like this. The, this area is the um, university campus. Um, some part the um, GPS uh, is not good, put the, in, other, in other side, in, in other street, the tree. Yes. Uh, it's very common. It it really is, Anna, and um and the thing is, you know, one of the th as I as I zoom in, um one of the things again, we're just looking at the land cover data, right? Um, but one of the things that that pops out is, uh, we do have tree canopy, right? We can see the shadows on top of some of the buildings. We can see uh some of the cone shapes along uh some of the walkways. Um, and different aspects like that. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, that to me uh, sort of demonstrates a little bit of um, the challenge of, of this, right? Um, we run into image resolution um, issues, even with very, very high resolution imagery, um, you know, when trees are really close to each other, it can still be hard to figure out which one we're talking about. And what I what I really like is is here's a dem great demonstration of um, what that canopy that we were just looking at actually looks like on the ground. You have all of these branches that clearly can influence a radar signal or a radio signal, uh, a GPS signal, or any kind of things like that as it bounces around all of the branches and the leaves. So it totally makes sense when I look at that at that upward photo 
uh, one, that I'm seeing something that looks like the satellite imagery, uh, but it also uh, speaks to what you're talking about, Anna, of um, the challenge of locating yourself, uh, you know, very accurately, uh, even using a high resolution imagery like this. I want to highlight Anna. What I one of the things that I notice it when I when I'm looking at at these photos in particular, um, this this picture is the workshop. Uh, I make a workshop with the teachers um, and a student about the land cover and um, uh, uh, bio, bio, biometry. But uh, in this moment, <laughs> the the maybe uh, some student uh, make measurement three. And the line is the other people uh, make a land cover. Right. And, yeah. And, and, and again, um, I think that's a great demonstration of how just because you see something in the imagery, um, you might need some more context. Right. Uh, like, why isn't that at the base? Um, is that 50 meters uh, at the end there? Or what is the distance that that is supposed to be? So you really highlight some of the fun detective work that that you can do uh, when you start exploring uh, this database because one I really like that there is this flag here and uh, and as well as the end of the of the of the tape um, because this is the demonstration of it's, the difference it's between the flag. <laughs> Right. It, well, this is the this is a muck measurement to me, um, right? Like you actually have a tape measure out. So Anna, since we have you here and you can tell us a little bit about this, how far out was this little orange flag from where the person was standing? It might not be exactly, but you mentioned um, it might be for the land cover one. So would that be 10 meters out or 50 meters? Uh, maybe I don't remember. Would uh, may, maybe 20, 23 meters more or less. Okay. Right. Um, and so you know, this to me is 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 one of those this very is helpful in the pieces. University campus in this right. area. Yeah, and and um and again, this actually I think is is one of the one of the perfect things that you demonstrated with your uh, with this training is uh, redundant data that uh, gives us different perspective, actually, right? Um, we see a different side of that tree, a different side of this parking lot out here. Um, and th those different perspectives, um, it allows us to gain confidence um, in where we're actually locating ourselves on the map. Uh, and uh, and so you know one one of the things that that uh, I like I said I wanted to to really sort of demonstrate that um, wonderful aspects of what I'm seeing in these photos right here, and so um, one of the pieces right that I hope we have field notes in the Globe Observer, and this is one of those pieces that hopefully people are recording inside of there. Uh, uh, how far to this from where they took their observations? Uh, uh, this picture, the uh, maybe the last picture. <laughs> yeah. The people is in the center, the the um, cross, mm -hmm. and make a, a land cover with global server. But right. uh, uh, maybe uh, in before uh, make a measurement with a manual traditional measurement. Mm -hmm. Manual, no right. use of the uh, two methods. Right, uh, uh, yeah, and and so I, I I love that you know because again a, a photo might have a particular purpose uh, for that researcher, right? Like they are maybe taking a tree height observation, um, but somebody else like me can come along and still make use of this data um, and and put a different lens on it. And maybe actually count um, how many cars do I see in this parking lot, uh, which might relate to land use. How many people are in this area, in this pixel, and are using these trees, are interacting with these trees? Um, 
those are some of the things that I that I really like when I start uh, being able to make some sense and starting to uh, have something like a dashboard like this that allows me to uh, understand and start to see uh, the contributions from the globe globe community like this. I just uh, thank you, Anna, so much for uh, taking us through and 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 sh and describing some of what we're seeing here, um, because this is one aspect of 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 the type of data we have available to us, um, and I think one of our goals here in our campaign is to connect not only our own measurements but our measurements in relation to other data um, because that's ultimately what NASA science is all about, right? It's uh, if we're talking about this, the same tree, great. Well, now we can actually start to see uh, how healthy is this tree or what type of needles might we have on this tree and all kinds of wonderful questions like that. Hey, Peter, that was, that was a little bit of a, of of a drill down into into what we we're uh, trying to trying to accomplish it, it with uh, our campaign, uh, and I'm glad that we had Anna here to be able to walk us through some very very recent measurements. I'm glad she was able to do that in real time as you showcase you know the features of uh, ArcGIS and what uh, people have been putting into the system. Uh, so that teachers can view not just their data, but data from all over the world. I Like I said, as you're talking, I'm playing around with this as well, uh, because this is new to me. So it, it's great to be able to see that, but seeing a, a real-time demonstration of the functionality, I thought that was really yeah. cool. Yeah, and thank you for that, Peter. I mean, because this this is a lot of work. And one of the things that, um, again, is, is back there that I was trying to... Um, find myself, uh, but we can actually see some of the attributes inside of here, like when this data was taken, um, what was the country, and then we have um, what is known as that site ID. And um, and this is that unique um, reference code um, that, we're, that, that we, can, we can use to start uh, combining together with some really exciting new data sets. And this is um, where uh, um, the European Union and NASA have really gotten together and GLOBE has found themselves in the perfect place because some of the new satellite imagery is getting linked to um, this MGRS system. Um, and that's what these codes relate to. And this is that 100 meter area um, that uh, that that all of our data gets grouped into when you're looking at the Viz system, or when you are um, starting to look for satellite data, and so what that means is we're moving from having to wait 16 days to get a repeat observation from space of this location that Anna was describing to us, um, and by using many different satellites and putting them onto the same grid system that GLOBE uses, uh, we're able to get down to repeat observations anywhere from on a daily cycle all the way up to uh, uh, maybe five days um, at the slowest. But it's it's really exciting because um, what, what that means is we can start getting phenology and that greenness number at the same resolution as what uh, Anna is seeing down here in her field of view and the buildings that are uh, blocking our field of view in some cases, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, and, and really, if we start going into the details of some of these, uh, that, uh, that of the data that's inside of the, the database that people are contributing, it is really pretty astounding. And so one of the things that we that that Anna and anybody can can do is uh, search through and find their organization. Um, and like I said, if you're looking for groupings, you have a site name inside of here that actually groups things together. And so here we're looking at three sites, but 14 observations. And so this that, that whole way of 
um, where are we in the world and what data do we have to work with is um, it, to me a, a really wonderful place that uh, everybody can make contributions to science. Because Anna, I really hope that, you know, since this is on a campus um, and now that we have these locations with ground photos, I would hope that in the future, um, maybe next month, people will be able to go back to that and do a repeat observation, right? In this, in this area, I, I need to uh, make more measurement. Yeah. Maybe starting, but I continue all the, the, the campus. Maybe uh, make a sensor, no, no uh, sample, sensor, yes. all, all the street. Uh, in Neuquén is a uh, very arid uh, area. Uh, yeah, and and you're you're exactly right. And here I want to uh, uh, I'll zoom quickly, uh, and it'll take a little moment to grab some of the data. But I'm going to just zoom in here to an area that I've spent a lot of time working with my globe uh, community. Um, and you can actually see, you know, Anna, we started off in a similar way where we did a small workshop and we did some contributions and working. And now we're up to 572 observations in 212 locations. And you can see that they're clustered around um, in certain locations. Um, and so I started off just discussing this idea of sampling and making sure that we are, uh, you know, getting the diversity of a community. And so, you know, that's something to, to consider, Anna, like you said, as you go ahead, um, the, the, the grid pattern that globe has is your friend. Um, you know, even stopping, um, walking for five minutes and stopping and doing an observation every five minutes is another good way to do some of these transects and to fill in uh, data like this. And what I get excited about, like I said, is um, here when you start getting repeat photos, we have one location that has 30 sites or 30 observations that have that have come in. And that allows us to do this repeat, uh, to do um, seasonal changes, to look at what was happening there. And um, and one of the things to, to highlight here that, or that I will highlight, you know, is I wasn't standing in the middle of the street or I would hope that nobody's <laughs> standing in the middle of the street here, right? So um, when it you is see- the same problem here. <laughs> Right, right. So, so I really want to stress to everybody is that um, you know use your use your safety and common sense, and please do not go and stand in the middle of the road to do repeat observations. And, um, and, and uh, Peter, you were saying something last time we talked about this because yeah. this this happened to Brian as well. Yes, and, and we had that same comment. You were saying that there's a problem with the GPS, and you do something in order to help fix that when you open up your app. Yeah, so one of the things that I always do is um, I, I I use a navigation tool um, uh, to locate myself because that's usually um, going with the with my uh, mobile device uh, location services very very often. You know, it's how I navigate around the world, um, and so that usually works really well to then give me the the close coordinates to where I'm standing. Um, but as we as we highlighted earlier on with the GPS protocol that Globe has been doing with all of our measurements since 1995, um, you know there's an accuracy to all of these coordinates, and um, and so we need to start incorporating that plus or minus around um, any location that we see. And one of the things too that ends up happening is you'll see a grid pattern that might start appearing inside of your data when you zoom in really close. And that does go back to the resolution of our, uh, uh, our measurement, um, of our GPS measurement or our location measurement. We only have so many decimal points that we have confidence in. Um, and so at a certain point, we do end up with this grid pattern where you can actually kind of see that uh, it looks like my points are um, about 
20, 25 meters or 25 feet apart kind of on this grid. So if you ever start to see a grid pattern in data, uh, stop, go read about how the data was created um, and you might be working at the limitations of, uh, of, of that data spatially, where it's located in space. And this happens with every single one of our satellite data. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to check our data when we put it into any database, um, you know, because if it's not in the right place, as I've stressed earlier, uh, we can't really do a lot with it, um, you know, because it it tells us that it was green in the in the world on that date, but we can't really combine it together with the satellite data, which is really what we want to be able to do. Yeah, and one and so one thing here that that I will say that is useful is to put a locator here. Um, you know, this, this photo has a telephone pole um, at the very center. Um, and so one of the things that this demonstrates is perspective of our imagery, right? Uh, and, uh, and even though this was vertical, it looks like it is vanishing into our, um, our feature. So, um, you know, but here, when we actually uh, zoom in, here we can actually see the shadow of the pole, and it looks like it moved over, and so we see a different view of that of that same pole. And so, e even though we can't see the the object very well, we can see we can we know it's there because of the shadows, and it's the same thing when we look to our north photo. Um, here we can see that road that um, some of our points ended up in. We also see the shadows of the trees that are around there. And uh, and that to me is really just really important part about uh, making sure that we're probably talking about this location right here. And what I find fascinating is over here, when this high resolution image was taken, um, there's no leaves on those trees, right? And um, it looks very similar to this particular photo, which was uh, taken March 8th of 2020, right? And we can see, uh, you know, uh, that that's what we're aiming for is, is if we're seeing uh, no leaves on the trees, we're hoping that our satellite image is also seeing no leaves on the trees. What we're also looking for is when you have green in your image or in your location, but this satellite imagery or uh, those measurements are showing that it's not as green, right? This mismatch in timing is something that we're looking for as well, uh, because that's how we can we we know that it's these are deciduous trees um, because at least in May um, there's leaves on the trees but here in uh, a different time um, when this image was taken uh, it does not appear that there's leaves on the trees so I want to go back like and you know because here is the demonstration that we were talking about right we can actually see the leaves on the trees going to leaf off conditions. And then we have a big gap where no observations were done in this location. This is a common thing and, and we'll come back and we can talk about what do you do when you have a gap in your data like this. Scientists deal with this challenge all the time. Uh, but what's interesting is that at least in July and then again in May, those, those are showing us that there's leaves on trees in this location. Well, at another point in time, looks like going back to those same months of December, January, February, March, uh, there are not reported uh, to be leaves on trees in this location. So from all of that, we have a hypothesis that we can test um, and, and move forward with. And, uh, and so, I, I just I, I really wanted to to demonstrate for all of us um, how using Globe Observer and the land cover tool in particular, um, but also the tree heights, 
gives us this phenology question, and, or at least gives us insights into phenology, tree phenology of what's happening there. So keep up this rapid assessment and, uh, and we can actually help to understand this variation in, um, in, in tree phenology that's happening. And we can see that occurring throughout the world. So people in the, in the European phonology campaign wanted to see how things were different in the U.S. They can mm -hmm. quickly toggle back and forth and see the difference in time, right? That's exactly right. And and that, you know, it, one of the trade-offs that we, that we have to make is making sure that we have enough observations, right? Um, and so, so that is where if you take in more area, um, you're more likely to have data to work with. And, and we can actually see, um, you know, inside of here that there's some places where there's, wow, 30 observations or 30 uh, observations, and then other places where there's only one. Um, and so that sort of discrepancy, it does create challenges for our students and for us as uh, all of us as researchers, right? So, uh, you know, there's trade-offs and, and, and considerations that we want to make here. But that to me is why being a good steward really is, you know, trying to contribute your, your data, even if um, you may not be ever use it, right? Because uh, we, have, we have students here that might just focus on North America, where you can see this clear kind of up-down pattern that uh, is very familiar to those of us in um, in in the United States, right, Peter? Mm. It, when, when you scroll back over the um, the green, um, mm -hmm. I see a number that pops up. It says yeah. yes, one oh eight on that day. Is that yeah. how many? observations that did see um, leaves on that day? Correct. So. That's exactly what it is. And, um, and, and a lot of this, you know, what it, we're working with a percentage here um, because on some days or some months, we get a lot of observations and then other months um, we might see only 59 come in. Right. Um, and so it's looking at who, con who contributed um, and during that time period, and what did they say? And so this, again, is where we can get really balanced if we aren't, uh, if the whole globe community isn't participating, right? Um, Anna's data could, can, can get lost down below, um, uh, you know, because there's uh, only a handful of contributions coming from a certain location. Um, and uh, and so it may look like when we look or when we examine the full data that maybe there isn't a pattern there or there isn't a, a good contribution. But when you actually zoom in to certain regions and when you look at your data like this, um, that is exactly where you can see some of these regional patterns. And you're right, Peter, that this is interesting to me. Um, but it, be, it gets even more interesting if we were to zoom out and move over and, like you said, compare and look at another globe region's data and, 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 and ask the question, are we seeing the same patterns, the same months? And yes, no questions are really easy. All right, it looks like it's uh, spinning out and uh, it, we're gonna get a little bit of information here. But so it auto populates, you just basically zoom in an area and it will just populate with the data that's been captured in that um, area that you're seeing in the middle there? That's exactly the way that I have this map set up. And, uh, awesome. and it's doing a spatial filter. And so what it's actually asking or, or doing is, it's looking at the upper left coordinate and uh, the um, and the lower right coordinate, um, and the lower uh, lower right right coordinate, um, and and the upper right coordinate, um, and those have latitude longitudes. And so uh, when we actually go and look at our range, we can see that um, it's at least you know mainly in the northern uh, at fifty degrees north here at Copenhagen. 
Um, and then um, looks like the longitude is still loading up. Um, but, uh, you know, we get that range. And I think that's an important piece for all of us to remember is that um, with a map, we have that 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 filter and those numbers that we expect in that area. And so if students, if, if any of our data isn't showing up, usually that's the first place that I look is, did we enter the latitude and longitude correctly? Um, and I see a lot of errors where um, they end up on the other side of the world simply because they weren't recorded in the correct fashion, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, this 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 double check of your data is one way that you can start to um, get confident in uh, your ability to use your data. And if we go here to um, our leaves on the trees, it looks very similar to what we saw in North America, right? Um, I feel like there's a little bit maybe a harder shoulder here in October to November. Um, you know, where it goes leaves on to leaf off with a few places still with the with the leaf on. And I think that's one of those things that if we look at 2019, we had 23 submissions in January that all said no. And then in February, we had 21 submissions. So we're trying to sort of to make a pattern out of 21 observations. So that sample is really small overall. We'd like to see that closer to at least 100 um, or much higher than 21. But what's interesting is that, you know, 2019 and then again in 2020, we have some times when there were no leaves reported on the trees. Later on in 2023 and then again in 2024, in February, we actually do see at least some locations that are reporting leaves on trees. Now, Peter, you asked earlier, uh, you know, why is that? Um, is the, you know, it, could this actually be an example of uh, climate changing where uh, leaves are, 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 are leaves are actually staying on trees longer? Um, and it could be. Um, or it actually could be, uh, again, where our sample came from in 2024 in our participation versus 2019 and who was participating um, during that time. Uh, and you're exactly right how the, the campaigns, our emphasis can actually describe why we're seeing um, the map look the way that it does, and also our graph and our measurements look the way that it does. I, I know we have about uh, 10 minutes before we have to wrap up. Um, I do want to note that I, I notice um, on each little screen, there's a download. Does that mean you can download this, this graph or this data to incorporate yeah. in a presentation? Yes, that was one of those things that I that that was an option in um, in this using this particular uh, uh, tool, and so um, I have tried to for myself to make it easier to access some of this data, the summarized data, um, and so uh, so um, I have this available in a couple different spots, and um, and you know because I really want to know. Uh, um, some of the data that I'm working with, and I wanted to get it really summarized easily, where it's just the yes, no question, um, or, um, you know, show me all the photos down here um, in the, that are, that have a north photo to them. Because one of the things that, that I noticed um, going across is not every location has a photo to it, or uh, every location might not have all the data. Mm -hmm. So, Sometimes that's one of the first things that I'm looking for is uh, what is most what what measurement is most complete um, that has all of uh, the photos so that I have more data and information to work with. And so you can see that we actually have some variation where the north photo is, we're getting uh, most through the system. Um, and we have a 92, in this area, 92% of all of the records, 
the 3000 records have a North photo. In contrast, we're not getting as many down photos or up photos at these locations. Um, and you can see that there, if you if you look across, only 86 or 87 percent of uh, these records have a down photo or an up photo with them. And there's reasons for that. Um, but I want to encourage everybody to try to submit, uh, you know, complete data sets like this. Um, there's reasons why uh, you might have why you might miss data, but um, you know this then becomes something that we have to adjust for or think about uh, what ends up happening or what should we expect at this location if I see grass, uh, grass, 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 but I do see something. You know, here I'll blow this up a little bit. I see this tree shadow kind of going across. So I would hypothesize that my upward photo here would have um, some influence from trees in some way, but I don't really know what to expect here, right? Um, I can only hypothesize what to expect based on these other photos that are submitted. And so that again is just part of sifting through this data and seeing what's available, what's not, um, and uh, and like I said, 55 attributes here, 70 in in our in the newer updated database, um, and it's just a lot to work through. And one mm -hmm. of the things, again, you know, if we look through here, we have one site that has 141 repeat observations to it. That could be a really interesting location to 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 look at um, and see. What is the pattern at that location? Because we have a lot of rapid assessment, uh, you know, uh, uh, observations, and then the photos that help us to see, is that green? And why is that green in that location? Well, I feel like you can really do, or our, our audience can really use a, a like a um, tutorial on something like this, because I really feel it would be very useful. Um, for not just our teachers, but students when they're doing the research as well. Um, yeah. Could you, could you explain one one more thing before we have to wrap up? And I actually want to go to the chat as well, because Anna shared a lot about her um, research that she's doing. I just wanted to uh, mention that as well. Yes. But the pie chart in the middle there, can you explain that to us? Yes. So, so the pie chart, I didn't know what else to name it right now. Um, but this is your second badge in the land cover tool, which is... Um, labeling your photos. And if you go through and label each one of these directional photos in terms of um, that uh, muck code or the classification system that you learn mm -hmm. about there, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you then end up getting an overall label. And so, it, you know, here we can actually see it's grass in one direction, grass in another direction, grass in another direction, grass in another direction. So it would fall into this label of um, one of the other 9% of, of what has been labeled as grass in that location. So, you know, the labeling of the photos takes a little bit more time. It takes a little bit more effort. It is just a rapid assessment of what do you see? and about how much is it. Um, but that then gives us that ability to quantify our land cover for our location. And at least here, we're seeing that most people are um, labeling medium grass and short grass. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, standing in grass is an easy place to make an observation. So that makes a lot of sense. We also see that there, we, we're getting a lot of cultivated observations. Again, that makes sense. Um, they're easy to get to. Um, they have edges, other things like that. Um, and so, you, you know, as you as if you're if you're able to add in these labels, that gives us another attribute and another way of organizing and looking at um, the, the the what's known as the fractional cover or is every direction that you look at there the same? And therefore it would be 100% grass. Or do you have an experience where maybe it's not grass? <laughs> Let's get one of these, like something like this, right? Where, where if you look in different directions, 
maybe you see trees in one direction, but grass in another direction. And that's that variation that we're, that we're looking to characterize and describe that might be missed in those in some of our, our maps that we look at. Just because um, the number of trees here might be small and it might be below the, uh, the area that the map makers or the instrument can actually see. So this idea of fractional cover or looking across all of your locations um, is, is what allows us to classify and label that, that overall um, location and to be able to describe it and who might be living there and um, in, you know what type of crops might be cultivated in this location. Right. Um, and I think what what I really like is let's just kind of see. Yes, this is what I was hoping to see is um, here. Um, we can actually see that we have a location where there's snow and ice that are coming at, at, at particular times of the year as well. So all of these little bits of information um, allow us to start putting together a story of a location of any location. Does it ever experience ice or snow? Does it have leaves on the trees? Um, and if, if you can answer those questions, what might somebody else find in those locations? And from that, we now have a hypothesis. If we wanted to go in and, um, and look at a particular location, say, let's just go here really quick. And, you know, we can zoom in and what we can actually start to do is, again, start to see the similarities in patterns, shapes, colors between our photo that was taken at uh, a time when there was no snow on the ground. And we can actually see this tree to the north and the shadow here and right here. So I personally really appreciate uh you know, the more detail, because right now, without having that information about the labels for that, uh, for, for these photos, um, I, I don't know, I can't, I can't search for it. We can't find it. We can't uh, uh, classify it and then, you know, compare it to um, um, some other layers or other information that uh, some other NASA satellites might have made. I know we're, we're short in time now, um, but I was going to say this really leads into a lot of the questions that we get from students is what do you do with our data? Do you really use it? Is Does it just go into a black hole? Uh, so this is great to see that it's actually being plotted, used, and available in a very easy way to see for our Globe um, audience to use. Um, I'm going to run off to another meeting very quickly because... That's my yes. day. But I do wanted to, I did want to um, mention a couple things in the chat and about re Anna's research. Um, yes. She is talking about, uh, I'm just read her comment. She says, we're going to be doing a census of the area um, in Argentina where they will plan to upload all their circumference uh, data to the carbon cycle. And her idea in working with University of, of Texas at Tyler is uh, our idea is to see how much carbon is stored on campus and compare it with the university in Texas, which is amazing. Um, and then they're going to also include measurements of clouds and look at meteorological um, information uh, to complement their measurements. Yes. So overall, it seems like they're, they're doing a great project. Um, they're also going to draw some attention and importance of, of urban trees in the different areas as well. Um, so she is doing quite a lot. And it looks like they actually won a um, grant as well that she posted earlier. So I just wanted to thank her uh, for, for sticking, staying on this long. Thank you for sharing your information about the work that you're doing, um, Anna. And uh, I'm sure Peter, myself, Brian, we would love to see your research when you're ready to present it to us. We'll love to, to highlight that at a future webinar because we, we love seeing anything with trees and land cover, especially if it's um, measurements that are, are a collaboration with different countries. That's even better. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to, to mention that before we wrap up. Um, and also, once again, love this program, uh, Peter. I, I'm glad you, you mentioned the link because I do plan on grabbing that and using it. Um, in future workshops, 
um, as I said, working with teachers and also working with students to say, you know, this is this is your data. Either, yeah. you know, put more into it. Uh, let's go. Let's let's add more. Um, because we never say no to more data. Um, but it's We're great greedy to like that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And and I, I I'm really excited about this too. And you know, and one of the one of the one of the things that we that I want to stress is that circumference alone is not enough to get um, at our carbon measurements, right? One of the things that that uh, that why we encourage you to do the land cover photos um, as well with these is because we want to see what is the width of the canopy, right? Um, and this gets into uh, some brand new data that is coming out this year that. Um, I, that that if you're able to get that canopy cover, um, we'll be able to to really highlight and and be able to map out the size of this particular tree right here that we can see, um, and we can see the canopy size about 50 feet um, for the, for that particular location. And um, and since I I I shared it earlier with uh, with the, uh, the other group, we have a new one meter canopy height map for the entire world that was recently um, uh, produced by Meta um, and Facebook, uh, you know, using their their pieces. So we're at this point, scientists are producing lots of lots of lots of data. So um, for us, we really want to make sure that what we're producing is of high enough quality that we can work with a one meter data set. And we can actually, you know, Anna, when you, when you are looking at your particular trees, maybe we can find those particular trees in these data sets so that we can start tying together these individual measurements together with how they come together to uh, create a carbon forest or the overall carbon area. So I'm really excited about all of this data that has come in over the six years of our campaign. Thanks for diving down this road. I wasn't necessarily planning on going there, but I love you know data exploration and however we can get there. And you're right, Peter, we needed to spend some time getting in and showing people that we are not only collecting this, but there's real science that can be done right now um, through these activities that everybody in this community is continuing to partake in. So thanks so much for uh, joining us in our Trees Around the Globe Student Research Campaign webinar today. And, uh, and, and good luck with everybody's research out there. And we will see you next month. Yep. Thanks a lot, Peter. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much for all.